The multidimensional poverty index shows that between 2015 and 2020, um, 135 million individuals were brought out of poverty. The poverty has really reduced enormously in India. Mr. Modi becoming the Prime Minister in India and in India and the Indian argumentative economists now wanting to criticize, which is everybody's right to, but now since you don't have the conclusion that you would like, mm. you're now going into saying the data is wrong and thereby achieving the ideological conclusion. The data is correct, but how you interpreting it and so on and so forth is a problem. One of the first things that developing countries did when they undertook economic reforms was to reform agriculture. Mm. The 1991 reforms in India, uh, which changed the course of Indian history, uh, economic history certainly, didn't even touch agriculture and matter of fact, made agriculture less competitive. Our estimate is that China and India will have the same per capita income level by 2042-43. Prime Minister Modi goal of a developed country by 2047, no matter what definition you use, is heavily achievable. Welcome to the 10th episode of the NIJ podcast with Ananya. Today we have the immense pleasure of introducing our distinguished guest, a luminary in the world of economics, Mr. Surjit Bhalla. Mr. Bhalla is the past executive director for India at the prestigious International Monetary Fund or IMF and has also been previously part of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. Trained as an economist from the Princeton University, Mr. Bhalla's work is not confined to academia and extends to advising the government, international banks and even the multilaterals. Known for his thought-provoking commentaries on Indian economy, Mr. Bhalla is known for his direct and factual approach towards demystifying major economic issues for common readers and listeners. So, here we are. A very warm welcome, Mr. Surjit Bhallaji, for joining us today for episode number 10 for Podcast with Ananya. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. My pleasure. So, for this particular episode, we are doing a little tinkering with the format. And uh, since, of course, you're trained as an economist uh, and have been, you know, I would say one of the most vocal economists who've been able to demystify and unbundle major economic issues for an arm army, um, I thought, let us look at some 10 top questions that an arm army might have. Or an arm aurat. Or an arm aurat. Ek dam, sahi. Or an arm aurat may have on uh, the Indian economy. And uh, so we have 10 questions. It's more like a, a rapid fire. But rapid, I don't mean your answers need to be rapid. Uh, but uh, I looked up the net, I looked up social media and I found that there are these 10 hot top burning topics where people are looking for answers, looking for the right data, looking for the right perspective and are yet confused. So we are hoping that uh, with your help, we are able to pin down the right data and get the right message across. Deconfuse and demystify. Deconfuse and demystify. So I think without further ado, let's uh, get started. My first question. Um, everybody, again, an arm admi and arm warat knows e GDP is the data, uh, is the indicator through which we capture the growth uh, of a country. And when I looked up GDP, I found that, you know, recently uh, Mr. Arvind Subramanyam, uh, who's the ex-chief uh, economic advisor, um, he wrote uh, an, about a paper uh, looking at a multi-country regression and spoke about how India's GDP is probably overestimated. And in fact, he went on to say that possibly it's not 7% as it is claimed to be, 
it's a lot lower and even said that even a 4% GDP growth might paint a rosier picture than what's the reality on the ground. So what is the truth? What is a common Indian supposed to think of this? Well, let's take, uh, I remember that study very well. And indeed, um, I was very surprised at that conclusion. Um, we were in a seminar where I gave my interpretation of it, which I'll now expand on. His method, what I did, and it was published in, I think, Indian Express, is that used exactly his method and only did it for 30 countries uh, rather than just India. He uses electricity consumption and a few other such exports and so on and so forth. What was interesting is, and that tells you a lot about his methodology, uh, data that he used are used identical. All right. Identical data. So no differences in data. The same data set. Methodology that he used are used, I tried to replicate, identical. Okay. So no problem. Except I did it for 30 countries rather than just for India. Mm. The country that comes out with the greatest overestimation of GDP growth was Germany. Point of this is that, and this is, you know, there is a tendency um, and it's worth looking into as to why has there been um, a constant questioning of the results, let's take, on GDP data, and we can go into employment and so on and so forth, from previously around the world at international institutions, the same ones that Arvin Subramaniam has been at, I've been at, as well as others, academic institutions, uh, major scholars uh, like Jagdish Bhagwati, Amartya Sen, T.N. Srinivasan. Um, you know, economists love to are more argumentative than the normal Indian. And if you have an Indian economist, then you can quite see. But all of the discussions over the last 50 years, and I'm taking out the last 10 years, um, have been on policies, on issues. Um, what is the right policy to follow? Direct uh, growth versus indirect uh, policies and so on and so forth. Uh, and all published um, and never was there a question. And we all knew the data uh, was, was not perfect. Oh. Um, I remember my book, Imagine There's No Country, in published in 2002, where I looked at how people calculated poverty. Um, and so it was that the data is correct, but how you interpreting it and so on and so forth is a problem. Unfortunately, and, and this is a, the standard pattern around the world, there is a massive coincidence with Mr. Modi becoming the prime minister in India. And in India and the Indian argumentative economists now wanting to criticize, which is everybody's right to uh, criticize and evaluate, but now, since you don't have the conclusion that you would like, mm. you're now going into saying the data is wrong and thereby achieving the ideological conclusion that you, you're prior. So I have a prior. And let's say for purposes of discussion, the prior is that growth post-2014 has been lower or poverty reduction post-2014 has been lower than pre-2014. Mm. And it's all centered actually on 2014 and after and right. 2014 and below, uh, before. And so that's where then you manufacture anything. Mm. So like in, it is uh, in a cloaked in, in sophistry and sophistication. Uh, that, look, I've done this analysis, I've looked at electricity data, I've looked at exports was the other 
data. I've looked at manufacturing growth, whatever it is. And I find that, look, the growth rate is in 3% or 3.5% was what was its number was. Now, every piece of data that has come out post that has been proven wrong. Now, he certainly was proven right when we had COVID, but I think uh, most economists would look at that that is not the fault of the data. That's the economy, that there was COVID, there was a lockdown, therefore you had growth less. Um, you know, that's a very simple, straightforward explanation for what happened. But uh, so now, you know, so anyway, so the... Just to conclude on this, his study that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't stand up to any scrutiny whatsoever. And you and others have to make up your own minds as to why it's happening. Okay. All right. I think you've given us some perspective on how data itself may be used out of context uh, to possibly... Um, suit a particular narrative or not, and when it does, the key word there huh. is narrative. Hmm. Hmm. Go ahead. And possibly when it doesn't suit the narrative, then you start to question. Manufacture data. the narrative. Yes, and so and manufacture the data. Right, and sort of also build some skepticism about the true picture because I mean, it's it's not surprising that that's the first question I have because if I look up GDP data, that's possibly one of the debates which does prop up whether GDP, what we understand, 7% growth, whether that's true or not. But I think, as you said, um, given the facts that you've shared, and if Germany's data is overestimated, then I think it's for the <laughs> listeners to know or understand and make sense of what's really happening here. So picking on a similar debate, um, another piece that I found was wherein uh, the ex-RBI governor, noted economist, uh, Mr. Raghuram Rajan, talks about, and he recently spoke about how India does not need a manufacturing model. And he says, he almost says that India should in, indeed be a purely or majorly service-led economy. My question really is, is that even possible? First of all, there is again a long-standing debate hmm. um, in India and discussion that no matter what statistic you look at, uh, the share of manufacturing in India's GDP is lower than the share of manufacturing of comparable countries. So unlike the Mr. Subramaniam, this is actually uh, a correct um, reading of the facts. Okay. Now, why is it there is the more interesting question. And recently, and, you know, there are, for example, um, the world has changed. And services, I don't know how many of your listeners know that a Tesla car is much more services, 80% services. That is computer coding. All of this is services. Second, take, for example, non-tradables like, you know, going to a doctor and having your x-ray seen, right? So you need a doctor in your local community, you need to go there, etc. Now, that is a service which is not tradable because your doctor is here, etc. But you know what? Over the last 10, 15, 20 years, this is increasingly a service. Your whether how effective or not, now artificial intelligence. Now artificial intelligence will read your X-ray and replacing a uh, American doctor in the U.S. who you send your thing. So I think you know I have been arguing that really um, the definition of or the content of services is now much more, right. much wider than it ever was. Right. That's number one. Number two, and this gets to data, and one of the leading uh, Indian economists who has 
looked at this issue in some detail, Mr. Goldar from the Institute of Economic Growth, and he's recently presented a paper where he looked at the data on manufacturing in India and compared it to other countries and reached the conclusion and soon be in public domain that actually the share of manufacturing is uh, labor in manufacturing was much larger than commonly assumed. So this is a, a, a proper debate um, and this, uh, no, nobody is saying, neither Goldar nor Raghura Rajan or anybody, that the data are wrong. Hmm. They're very different than the earlier debate. And yet, different conclusions are being reached. And that's the nature of research. That's the nature of economics. Um, so on this one, I think it is... Uh, an open and the world has changed. So those uh, there are many uh, economists who argue that uh, we have missed the boat in manufacturing and etc. I am not in that camp uh, precisely because um, you know I think uh, services are a much much greater fraction of our employment and our GDP. Um, and, and, you know, it is, so maybe we should not measure even, it's the definition of services mm -hmm. that has changed. So, um, you know, and I think, uh, India again, uh, in terms of the growth, uh, in services, matter of fact, everything that, uh, our GDP growth over the last 30, 40 years. Uh, in services and you know computer software um, has been much higher than in manufacturing. China, for example, is a complete contrast where it was this assembly line workers. Mm. You produce manufactured goods um, and they stole the march on everybody. Um, we didn't and we should you know perhaps uh, go into why did we miss the march? Just like we missed the march, in agricultural reforms, uh, one of the first things that developing countries did when they undertook economic reforms was to reform agriculture. Mm. The 1991 reforms in India, uh, which changed the course of Indian history, uh, economic history certainly, and economic performance, didn't even touch agriculture and matter of fact, made agriculture less competitive, uh, more state intervention uh, than, so maybe we should look at, and you know, again, um, the Prime Minister Modi tried to bring in agricultural reforms, and these very same people, uh, this is where ideology comes in. Um, so don't confuse me with facts, I have my ideology. Uh, it seems to be the motto of many people. Um, and, uh, you know, so in agriculture is the one area that I would have the form, and we should ask, why is it that that wasn't done? Right, right. Well, thanks for giving a very good insight, I think, for not just a student of economics, but as we talked, we spoke about GDP, we spoke about growth. To get an overview of, you know, the three major sectors, ag, manufacturing and services and sort of putting that in perspective. Coming back to the debate on data, um, because, and that's my third question, because you said, right, that the second question is more about, around the data is there and then there are two camps, you know, one which would rather have a manufacturing-led growth or see that in perspective, the other possibly talk about not focusing on manufacturing alone. Now, coming to the third question, it goes back to that debate on what is the truth behind the data, and that's on data around unemployment. Um, again, it's a very uh, open debate. Uh, it's possibly one of the biggest, um, I would say, if I can say criticisms, that uh, it is almost a political criticism as well from the other camp to say that since 2014, 
India has seen a jobless growth or even before that, that India has been experiencing jobless growth and that there are no jobs for the youth. So how do you answer somebody who comes up with this question to you with the right data and figures? The last part, with the right data and figures. Huh. Let's go backwards from that. What is the story on unemployment in India? There is, for since 1960 or 50 a major source of data on consumption and employment have been the NSS surveys. And since 1983, the NSS surveys on employment and unemployment as well as on consumer expenditures and poverty are public and everybody can access those. Now, in 2017, um, and the unemployment rate in 2011-12, um, according to the NSS, the national unemployment rate was something like 2.5%. Now we have, starting in 1718, something that's called the PLFS, Periodic Labor Force Survey, which is exactly the same as the NSS survey before. And if you recall that when that data uh, was first released or delayed release because it showed an unemployment rate of 6.2%. This is government data, PLFS, showing an unemployment rate of 6.2%. This very same data then, and actually as it happened, I, uh, along with Tita Das, had done a paper for the Economic Advisory Council, and it's available on their website. And uh, This paper came out sometime in a uh, study, large study on employment and unemployment, came out sometime in 20, uh, mid-2019. And it showed that the unemployment rate in India, exactly what I mentioned, was something like 2.5% in 2011-12. And then there were two surveys done by the Labor Bureau and called the Employment Unemployment Survey for 2013 and 2014. So before, if you will, uh, Prime Minister Modi's election, um, and it showed that the unemployment rate in India was 5%. So in other words, and I, the point of the story is that what those who are, ideal, and I'll pursue that a little bit, those who are ideologically prone um, said, oh, unemployment rate has, and indeed the government did not delay the release of this data because they thought it was putting the economy and in an unfavorable light and it can't be right. And it finally, they did release the data. And I remember pointing out then in the newspapers, etc., Arey bhai, look at, you know, 2013-14. Yeah. And the world has changed, and I'll expand on that a little bit. Just now, since 2017-18, we have had unemployment surveys done by the same organization. Okay. okay. And the same organization that said it was 6.2% and so on and so forth. And this very same organization um, now has the, for the latest survey, that the unemployment rate in India is something like 4.2%. Okay. This is which year? This is 22-23. Hmm. Okay. Um, and the previous year was maybe 6%, but it's coming down. Hmm. Now, there is a parallel which doesn't quite fit with your opening question. Hi, Rama, kya ho gaya? You know, unemployment, bahut ho badh gai hai. Bahut problem hai. So there is another source of data, uh, which is run by a private agency called CMIE and Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, 
which came to life. Now, Center for Monetary Indian Economy has been publishing um, information on Indian capital markets since 1980, and everybody uses their data. They take the actual, they don't do any surveys on capital markets. They do whatever is publicly available data and then process it and make available uh, to um, everybody. And then in, coincidentally, everything seems to happen in India around, related to data questions around 2014. Mm. Um, so they, the CMI started doing uh, unemployment, employment surveys then. And here are the couple of interesting results. Um, they have systematically shown that unemployment rate in India is 10, 11, 12 percent. And a very strong feature of their data is on female labor force participation, mm -hmm. where the female labor force participation rate in India, according to their latest survey, is 8 percent. That is only 8% of women have any work, okay, are employed. Now, we all know, uh, and this data available by ILO and everybody else in all the different countries, um, that 8% is the lowest labor force participation rate in the world. The world, I was going to say, yes. Less than Yemen, less than war-torn economies. Um, you know, so I don't know, you are a woman, maybe uh, you guys know better. Uh, I certainly, and mind you, that 8% is then latched on. Huh. Again, ideology plays a role. Uh, 2014, Post Modi, pre Modi plays a role mm. because you have labor force participation rate of uh, women at something like thirty yeah. uh, percent prior, and there's a definitional problem, but we'll get into. But let's just look at for the same time period, ostensibly the same definition. The PLFS NSS data shows that the labor force participation rate of women is somewhere around 30%, and the CMI shows that it's 8%. Hmm. The CMI shows that the unemployment rate is somewhere close to 14 15%, and the other data shows the national data, official data, PLFS data, the very same data that people used, hmm. okay, to say that, you know, Unemployment rates in India have shifted upward since uh, Modi came to power. That they use then. Now they are using the CMI data. So I think, um, you know, uh, my one central observation is that not only data is the new oil, data is the new ideology. Mm. So data being uh, used for. Political... Uh, yeah, for political purpose, purpose. For narratives. Narratives are very important, uh, and especially given social media mm. and its importance and its growth, um, that I think, um, you know, you have to, in order to push a narrative, you have to push some data. You can't say uh, it is so because I feel it is so. Ah. But you have to make it, even though what you're saying is what you want to believe because you feel that way, you have to show some data to support you. Right. So therefore, you go and manufacture data. Okay. Or cherry pick it and cherry, sort of... Well, cherry picking becomes... Uh, you, you stumble hmm. if you cherry pick data. Um... So very few people, the sophisticated ideologues, um, also do, yes, the, partly is cherry picking, but partly it is using some other data. And as we discussed the very first thing, 
on India's growth rate with Arvind Subramaniam. Methodology. That you do, you, mm. you construct a model mm. and, you know, there is in economics, uh, um, there's even a major article in American Economic Review saying I ran a million regressions. regressions. So, yeah. so you run a million regressions, you find one that suits your ideology. And then pick it up. And, and you pick it up and put it. Now, that is, if was a was cherry picking or cherry picking a result, uh, but the bluff was soon called when, as I mentioned, that you know, Germany uh, was cherry picking uh, the data the most. Right, right. Now, to close this question, we've spoken about unemployment data. Do you think we are measuring our jobs? In the right way, like, does India have sound methodology to really capture the employment that is being generated? And you spoke about how service economy is diversifying in different directions. Do you think we have the right systems in place or models in place to really capture the new types of diversified employment that's growing? As it happens, India has four measures of employment right from the beginning. The standard method of measuring employment in developed countries is you ask the question, did you work any day last week? And that's the measure. In India, we have, and other developing countries, instead of, did you work any day last week, did you work any hour last week? This is standard around the world. In India, though, and we've been pioneers in this, uh, starting from our very first survey, we have the daily steps. So, in other words, I go and ask them, just yesterday, uh, did you work uh, one hour and for all seven days? So that's one measure. Then you, I asked them, did you work any hour last week? That's the second one. Then I ask, what is your principal status? Where do you spend more than 180 days? So that's the principal status. And then I ask, okay, you know, did you have a second job hmm. on which this is to capture the diversification, etc., of the Indian and most developing country economies, but let's just stick to India. And did you have a secondary job? And then that is called the usual status. So to answer your question, we have been the original innovators of applying an appropriate definition for employment. Other countries, developing countries, haven't done this. And as I said, for the advanced countries, it doesn't make a difference because right. it's all standard, salaried, formalized. For, formalized employment. So, you know, and we publish... Uh, I think over time, over the next decade or so, we will graduate towards, um, you know, really just doing the, did you work one day last week? But that's part of development and part of the structure, the formalization of the economy where we are proceeding. Mm -hmm. But as of now, um, yes, to answer your question, Yes, we are measuring things properly. Uh, however, with a caveat that everywhere around the world, uh, in advanced countries and in developing countries, what you're finding is that the response error in surveys and the number of responses go down. You go to a house and you ask, can I interview you? You say no. Yeah. Okay, that's where, uh, and around the world, including especially the U.S., not especially, but that's where we have the most data for, is you have a problem. So um, that is to say that 
we are not facing any more problems or our data do not suffer, our employment data do not suffer from a greater uh, problem than in terms of measurement than it is even in developed countries. In any other country, which is developed. Coming back to labor force participation of women, a very simple question. I was looking at the figures. It was almost 30% in 1990s, dips down to almost 17.5% in 2018. Now it shows that it's again going up during covid the women's labor force participation data has gone up to 25% in 2020 21 let me just one just don't use are bhai covid se shut down ho gaya to whether women are working or men are working men were also went down to 10% okay so if there's a shutdown they're not working uh, completely meaningless to do any kind or other than to say, I think, and I've written papers that I think around the world, uh, shutdowns were completely uncalled for. Okay. But that's a separate debate. They did it everywhere in the world. We did it. And, uh, and actually, India did it for the least time period. It was shut down in, in March of. Uh, uh, 2020, what March 28th or so, and by July 1st, uh, the shutdown was removed, and states were allowed to mm. do whatever they felt like. Um, so uh, we were one of the earliest and to get in, and certainly the earliest to get out of shutdown. So forget that. Now let's look at the labor force participation, which I just talked about. Mm. There are two sources. Yeah. The CMIE, which is a relatively new private sector uh, source that started in 2014. And there's the traditional NSS. Mm. And indeed, the PLFS now is a more sophisticated version of the earlier survey. The urban areas are uh, where there is perhaps greater fluctuation in employment. The urban areas is are surveyed, uh, urban households are surveyed every quarter, and the rural households are surveyed uh, once a year. So um, certainly an improvement over, and it's done. And indeed, 1718 is not a, that it's more experimental. But nevertheless, uh, that's the data to use for whatever conclusion you want to come to. And... You know, and not the most accurate data in the world, but no data is accurate. As I just mentioned, even in the U.S., mm. uh, it's not accurate. But I would use the PLFS data for any inferences on jobs, unemployment, labor force participation, and I would not use the CMI data. So if somebody uses the CMI data, please ask them mm. um, as to... Uh, what is the basis uh, for that and uh, maybe we can have a separate session yeah. uh, and ask them in particular what is the evidence let me just give you some pieces of evidence on labor force participation rate of women mm. in India take STEM disciplines college education I don't know if you know or your listeners know that there are more women in college today than men Wow, okay. I really yeah. did not okay. know this. Okay. okay, okay. Number one. Now let's take STEM disciplines, and STEM disciplines is science, technology, yeah. medicine, yeah. you know what. Um, and the whole world is moving towards women in STEM. Mm. And India has the, amongst the large countries, maybe the maximum. Uh, percentage. There are a couple of small countries that are have more women in STEM than India has, but India has a forty-two percent. Okay. Okay. Of college, this is not STEM disciplines in high school. This is STEM discipline in mm. in college, and you know, 
And the U.S., by example, has 31%. Wow. So 31% of women in college in the U.S. are in STEM disciplines and 69 outside. In India, 42 and the highest in the world. Now, does that jive with an 8% mm. okay, labor force participation rate? Yes. Say no more. Okay. All right. My final question on... Um women's participation in labor force. What are your thoughts on unpaid care economy? Um, of course, with a lot of women looking at child care. I'm a young mother. Uh, do you think it makes sense to starting to calculate the economic input of care economy, um, especially, especially given, uh, you know? Yeah. No, no, no. I think that's a very... Um, important, pertinent uh, question. And uh, I'm with a team looking at it. My wife published a paper uh, just a few years back, maybe two years back, um, on that, uh, you know, Indian women um, spend a lot more time on the care economy, and I'll go into this uh, in a minute, than practically, and relative to men, practically anywhere else in the world. In the so, world, okay. Huh. Number one. Um, and we are doing some study and documenting this uh, on the basis of time use surveys. Hmm. This is a, a global phenomenon. Um, that is women spending, whether it is taking care of children and taking care of the elderly. Okay. So both sides, men seem to avoid doing any work. All women do a lot more work than they should. Whichever way you look at it, that's the reality. And around the world. Um, and it is one of the hottest topics of research, etc. And indeed, many scholars, including from the ILO, which is the benchmark, uh, the gold standard on labor issues um, are coming out with that, look, we have to include this um, in our estimation of labor force participation. Let me also add here that, look, you were giving numbers on labor force participation rate 2021 20, and post, but here's the interesting story on Indian female labor force participation rate that in 2004-05, the NSS survey showed that female labor force participation rate in India was something like 45%. Mm. And um, in 2011-12, that number, this is pre-2014, that number had gone down by about 10 percentage points. Now that happened because of a definitional change in terms of how do you measure women's work in rural areas where if you take care of cattle, etc., whether it should be included in your work or not. Yeah. But I wanted to come to something else. When you look at female labor force participation around the world, and you look at first Western countries, that the proportion of women going to high school, grade school, college, was steady and has stayed the same. Boys and girls go in equal proportion to school. In India and other developing countries, but let's stick to India, girls were going much less. Hence, the to school than boys, hence PM's uh, dictum of beti bachao, beti padal. Am betiya ko nahi padal hai, to the same degree as. So what happened? When the, if the woman, so the question is, if 10% are going to 
education, and this is ages 15 and above, um, X percentage, you can't be working. By definition, if you're going to school, you cannot be working. Now, if the same proportion went to school and work before, then you can compare across time. So we did a study, and it turns out that once you adjust for the fact that women are going to school in much school and college uh, in much greater proportion than before, then basically the labor force participation rate of women in India has stayed constant over time. So in other words, there is no, but this is new paper that is real, but it's already done in an LSE working paper where this is documented for 2011, 12 and before. So, you know, this thing, it's a, it's a measurement problem. Um, and the fact that, you know, you can't be in two places at the same time. Right, right. Are you, are you a full-time student? Or are you in, working? Or are you working? Right. So, um, one more question on data from India. What are the poverty figures? Would we say that in the last 10 years, poverty has declined? And if so, what does that magnitude or scale look like? And, and what indicators to really rely on when we are looking at holistically assessing how uh, okay. and how far is poverty dipping? Let's just look at the following. Um, you have the recent study, comparative study, on the multidimensional poverty index. There are various ways of measuring poverty. And the multidimensional poverty index index shows that between 2015 and 2020, um, 135 million individuals were brought out of poverty <laughs> in these five years by the multidimensional poverty index. <laughs> now, let's go back to a time period, just 2011-12. And at that time, the one measure of poverty in India was showed that poverty was 23%. This again gets into the somewhat arcane methods of measurement, but it's a really very simple one. And that the method, we had measured poverty in India since 1951, including the World Bank, mind you which is not exactly a great commentary on the World Bank, but anyway. Um, but in the 50s, they went to a household and they said, you know, how much rice did you consume last 30 days? How much wheat did you consume? How much salt? We are very particular, somehow the NSS is very particular about asking about salt. Not spices, this, that, but salt is a question. actually. <laughs> Salt March say Patani, you know, and I, when I was a member of the National Statistical Commission, I said, "Why are you wasting time asking on salt?" But never mind. The from in 1951, and it was an appropriate measure. Okay, each item, TV, TV to Tapthani, radio, whatever, you know, like a in the last foods. month. What did you pay for radios? What did you pay for a car? What did you pay for more what durables? What did you pay for your cycle? Uh, et cetera. Yeah. Then over time, and you know, this is where they became sophisticated and correct, that the world moved and we moved to now in 2011-12, uh, measuring for perishables, that is fruits, vegetables, meat, eggs, milk, most of them, okay, what did you consume in the last week? And then for other items, it's the last 30 days. And for consumer durables, it's the last 365 days. Okay, So we are measuring things properly. I want to just tell you, since you asked on poverty, if 
in 2009, in 2011-12, you used the traditional measure of 30 day, Recall. what did you do with 30 days? You had 23%. As of 2011. Yeah, 11-12. If, and this is again an NSS survey, not you did it the right way, which is now the official way, you got the poverty figure of 13%, one three. All right. So, 100 million people mm. in India in 2011-12 were moved out of poverty purely on the basis of a correct definition. And then you have this elaborate, multidimensional poverty index over five years. And both of them show that poverty has really reduced enormously in India. But don't tell that to the ideologue. Right, right. Now, I think this, the scale and this magnitude is also important for general audiences, for the youth to understand what is really changing in the country. Um, so that that's really... And then, of course, as you said, using the same parameter to for cross comparability would give you, you know, the right results in terms of how far the needles moved. Moving on to another question, and I think in our data conversations, we are somewhere or the other, you know, talking about developing as well as developed countries. So around uh, this question, um, I was, uh, you know, just reading up that. You know, of course, Prime Minister Modi's 2047 vision, which is India at 100, he speaks about how uh, India should target and, uh, sh and and how we could be, you know, moving from a developing country to the category of a developed country by 2047. What are your quick thoughts on this? Like, is it too optimistic or does this sound realistic given what the data and what does the economic trajectory looks like? Obviously, it depends on what you define the per capita income level of a developed country. Hmm. Now, there are, there are, firstly, it's on the basis of primarily the common shorthand, just like GDP, the common shorthand measure of being developed is by looking at per capita income. Mm. But then you look at countries that are dictatorial, like China, etc. There's not much freedom. And the people are hesitant to call them developed. Right. Okay. Freedom for women right. in Islamic countries in particular. Etc. Though there also now things are improving uh, quite rapidly. Actually. So, first, it's a very complicated what the definition of developed is. Mm. If you take the definition of developed as just per capita income, then the only example, so Europe has always been considered developed, mm. even if Portugal you know, etc., are relatively poor members of that develop. Um, the only known story of a country being recognized as a developed economy, which previously was not, which was universally considered not developed, mm. and over time is now universally considered as developed, is Korea. All right. South Korea. And in ninety in South Korea. And in nineteen ninety six, the OECD organization um recognized um Korea as a developed economy. So what in a paper presented, I examined this issue of whether how does India, uh, the same PPP income levels mm. like Korea, so we've got a standard, uh, and they are democratic, we are democratic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, if using the Korea uh, per capita income, 
at the time it became was recognized as developed and i think the number is 18000 per capita ppp per year um that we would easily achieve developed country status uh prior to 2047 okay and 2041 42 uh another recent paper um that i've been involved in showed that you know india and china were had the same per capita income again ppp from 1500 to 1980 so 480 years sometimes china was ahead by 5 10% sometimes we were ahead by 5 10% but the same per capita income. Then the divergence started to take place. China grew much faster than India. And in 2014, Indian per capita income related to China was at its lowest. Again, everything centers around 2014. Mm-hmm. Now, this is just a coincidence, but the India's, and it is to do with the fact that China was rapidly growing and we were steady, whatever. Um, that the ratio the of India's per capita income to China was something like 43% in 2014, just a decade ago. Huh. And so, I, you know, whether you want to consider China developed or not, but and this is per capita, so it takes care of the fact that lots of people. Um, bottom line our estimate is that we will reach that China and India will have the same per capita income level mm-hmm. by 2042-43. Now, and this is based on relative growth rates. So if China grows at zero, we grow at three with each conversion. China grows at six, we grow at nine with each conversion. China goes at minus six and we go at minus three with each convergence. So in other words, same per cap. So I think, you know, uh, and this is an interesting area of research which I'm quite involved in, Um, but all indicators suggest, in my view, but this is controversial, people have different estimates, that Prime Minister's Modi goal of a developed country by 2047, no matter what definition you use, is heavily achievable. Based on what the data Mm. shows. My final three questions to you, um, and I'm putting them on the table, is to do with one, a lot of multilateral and international agencies giving cross-country rankings. The second last question we'll come to is how that sort of played out in social media. You wrote an article about fake news giving rise to this almost a phenomenon called fake commentary on economics and data. And then my final question to you uh, would be on what do you think we need to do to build credible statistical systems? So this is... How? Let's go mm. backwards from the third one. Uh. What do we need to do to build credible statistical systems? Is uh, and that's in. I'll just speak from India, and then we'll extend it to other countries and to these uh, data that differ. Mm. First of all, statistical system, GDP data, economic data, industrial production data, uh, subcut. We are following the same that everybody else does, the UN system of accounts. Hmm. There is no problem, no difference in how we do it and how other countries do it. By other countries, let's take the US. Right. We are now on on surveys moving to uh, computer tablets, have moved to computer tablets. And obviously, they are more, but everybody's on the same page, no problem there. So what can we do? Just response error, this, that, and everybody is 
uh, I love that Indian expression, seized of the fact. That, look, data is, you know, the new oil. Uh, data should not be the new ideology. And that we need to improve data collection, etc. Everybody's on the same page. Um, and I think proceeding with cooperation so that the statistical agencies are in touch with each other as they should be. I think the import of your question is not on these kind of data, even though, as we discussed, there are some people who question the GDP data, but leave that aside. Um, are these indices of democracy? Uh, I would, don't, want, don't want to go into indices of nutrition, but where, where there are severe measurement problems, but uh, which everybody, I think, knows about. Um, but, you know, they are subjective indices. Is your press free? Okay. And I'll, let me, and are you democratic enough? What about political liberties and what about civil liberties? And let me just, though it doesn't apply to India, but maybe some uh, Indian critic will also say um, there was uh, an interview of Kazakhstan Premier. So it's available. It was a TV interview. And this interviewer, uh, very politically correct, there's no freedom in Kazakhstan. So, and this is the, the president of Kazakhstan. Uh, so he said, did you know that the internet is completely free in Kazakhstan? Everybody is on, there's no censorship. So you go on the internet, give your views, etc. And now let's compare that to Assange, who was thrown out of the U.S., etc., because he dared to speak against the government. Hmm. You know, so it's a problematic, um, these are subjective indices. How do you, I think the press in India is very, very free. Uh, the press in the U.S. is very, very free. Uh, in Kazakhstan is very, very free. But there might be some reason to think that X is more free than others. And I'm not debating that, but it is a, a very, very difficult hmm. task. And therefore, and there are people who've looked at it into greater detail, so on is the freedom of the press, uh, quality of democracy, or various others. They, these people who publish the indices are the clique. So it's self-fulfilling prophecy, the same people, are uh, used to, you know, evaluate different things. And, uh, you know, one big change in the world, especially in India, and I wrote about it in my book, Citizen Raj and, and before, mm. that I think one of the biggest stories in India is a change in the elites. And you want to understand why certain things are happening, why certain indices are be, show one, certain data shows one rather than the other. Interpretation of data is one rather than the other. Go back to the source and the, the source of the elite. And that change, I think the elite is now much, much more democratic hmm. in India than it's ever been before. And I think uh, that's why some people are stumped. Right. And that's the problem. <laughs> that, that, that's what makes it uncomfortable. So I think my final question, which initially I had as my icebreaker question to you, I'll probably put that across to you. Uh, it was called the icebreaker question. And now that's the concluding question. Uh, you worked in so many roles. You've been at the World Bank. You've been the, at the Deutsche Bank been with the IMF, Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, um, you've been at Princeton. What role have you enjoyed the most? You know, at, uh, my undergraduate major was engineering. Oh, you're an engineer by training. Uh, yeah, by training. 
Yeah. And by profession, that is, I worked a year and a half as a computer-aided design engineer in what is now called Silicon Valley. Mm. It was, this is 1969, uh, 70. You know, what a constant feature of my work, even as an engineer, um, was data and its interpretation. In the, as an engineer, it was uh, building um, radiation-free circuits in the lab. So, okay. again, a constant theme in my work, wherever, has been data, actually, and interpretation of data. Another constant theme um, in my work, and people accuse me, of being a contrarian, uh, and they are right, I'm a contrarian, but I want to give this explanation. The reason I emerge as a contrarian is that when I examine data, and it is comes out to be the same as what everybody else thinks, and I think, hmm. then I don't go ahead and publish it. I don't go ahead and write an article on it. Um, I mean, it's, you know, for me, what is most important is a man bites dog story, not a dog bites woman story. Mm -hmm. So, and data allows you to separate out uh, the stories or application of that data uh, allows you um, to call the bluff, uh, which I enjoy doing. Great. Um, I think that is sort of what we ended up doing for most of this episode, calling out the bluff uh, for a lot of these so-called controversies around Indian economy and data. Uh, but thanks to you uh, and thanks to your insights and thanks to your, I'd say, contrarian mindset <laughs> and that frame, which has given us the right perspective on the right data. Um, and as you really said, uh, let data not be a weapon of political ideology, but let data remain as the oil. So thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. And I really hope that all of our listeners will find this episode particularly very, very interesting and insightful. And thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much, sir. And that wraps up our rapid fire discussion on the Indian economy. If you enjoyed this particular format of the episode, we'd love to hear your feedback in the comment section below. Or if you're eager to explore more such topics or hear from different speakers in a similar format, please do not hesitate to share your suggestions with us. Before you go, make sure to hit that subscribe button and ring the bell icon. By doing so, you'll never miss an update from the NIJ podcast with Ananya. Mm -hmm.